We've all been taught red, yellow, and blue. And they're not actually the real primaries of a pigment color model. This is why color has been so hard for so many people. Hello, all my lovely, colorful creatives out there. Thank you for joining me on the Sage Arts Podcast. Sage here in the podcast room. The furries are sleeping at my feet and sometimes snoring. (laughs) So Ember's uh, on the lounge taking over. But if you want to metaphorically come join us, we can shove her over a little bit and you can come hang out with me while we talk about color. I can't tell you how excited I am about this particular aspect of talking about design. Because for one, I think a lot of people, they don't want to talk about color. They don't want to talk about color theory specifically. And I think in a large part, it's because it's like poetry. I have this whole thing about poetry, too, because those two things, when they're taught to us young, we are taught very specific things that we take on throughout our life unless we learn otherwise. And both things can make people feel stupid. (laughs) This is my theory, that people avoid color theory and they avoid reading poetry. Because in school, what we were shown and what we were taught, we didn't get it. I mean, the basics of color sounded like it was easy, right? You're going to learn, oh, red, yellow, blue, and you put those together, you know, red and yellow will make orange and yellow and blue will make green. and, And then you actually go to do it in real life and it doesn't work out that way. Well, today we are going to demystify color. We are going to talk about why for years we've all been struggling with mixing nice, clean, clear colors when, according to the formulas we were taught in, I don't know, second grade, don't work. But there is absolutely a easy way to mix colors and get nice, clean, clear colors. So if you have a material where you have to mix for color, for paints, for clays, I don't know, stains, dyes, whatever, or even if you don't, uh, this conversation is going to really help you understand why the color mixing thing has been such a mucky mess. (laughs) And we're going to talk about the history. We're going to talk a little bit about the science. So a lot of really cool, interesting background trivia kind of stuff. So even if you don't actually mix color for your materials, the visuals, because our eyes visually mix color, will be informed by this conversation as well. We're going to probably be doing this for three months, maybe even four months. I broke it down to three months, but I'm still questioning if that's enough time. <laughs> I also don't want to bore you with just color, color, color. Although, how I don't know. Can color be boring? I don't really think so myself. But in any case, let's see how this goes. You can send me your thoughts after you've listened to this one and let me know if the amount of information I gave you was maybe overwhelming or maybe it's underwhelming, or if you have questions that I didn't answer, please do reach out to me. I can be reached through the contact page at thesagearts.com, as well as through my socials on Instagram and Facebook, whether it's the post or direct messaging, I will get either one of those at the Sage Arts podcast pages. And if you enjoy what you hear and you want to give back and help and support this work, you can find donation buttons halfway down the homepage of thesagearts.com for PayPal and buy me a coffee. I really appreciate the financial support, especially all of those who repeatedly send me money every month, which is amazing. You're just you're just amazing. Thank you so much for keeping this going. Oh, and also I do want to emphasize that if you are not getting the newsletter already, the next few months, this is going to be pretty important, I think, because the newsletter is going to include visuals for what I'm talking about. And I'll make those downloadable. And then I'll also have it on the website under the episode page. And I'll leave a direct link in the show notes or description section of wherever you're listening to this podcast from. But right now, I think those will have to be a right click and save image situation. And I don't know how compressed they get. And I'll also get them up on Instagram and Facebook under the Sage Arts podcast pages. So you can look there as well. But there you'll only be able to look at it, not download it. And then the little cover for this episode also has a wheel with cool colors and warm colors and mud and this kind of basic stuff that we'll be talking about. So you can kind of refer to the cover if that's all you've got for the moment. And if you haven't signed up for the newsletter, there is a news and notices button on the homepage of the sagearts.com. And all of these links that I'm talking about, you can find them in the description section or show notes of wherever you are listening to this podcast from. So yeah, I usually don't like to start out with the most basic and 
kind of boring-ish stuff, but let's at least start by defining some basic color terminology so we're all on the same page in this conversation. But yeah, today we're going to talk about hue. We're going to talk about primary colors a lot. Uh, We'll talk about secondary colors as well. We'll talk about shades, tints, tones, temperature, and then we'll talk about color mixing models because there are actually two and we'll give you reasons for using one or the other. I definitely have a preference, (laughs) as you will hear readily. But in any case, let's get into this. So what is all of this stuff about? Well, let's start with hue, because this is the basics of color, right? So hue is what most people first think of when they think of color and color theory. I mean, scientifically speaking, each hue is a particular point on a color spectrum, on the light spectrum. And it's this breakdown of light. Like if a light goes through a prism, it breaks it into a rainbow. That's the light spectrum. So a hue is any one of those colors that we can see and define on there, which is basically every color there is. But we break them down to kind of categories. So there's reds and yellows and blues and greens and and that kind of thing. And within that, we have primaries. And what primaries are is they are colors from which no other colors could be mixed to make that color. And there are actually two different color models in the world. (laughs) There is a light color model and there is a pigment color model. The primaries in each of these are actually different. These primaries, these non-reducible colors, as they're called. And these differences and these primaries are going to be at the core of what we're talking about today. So it's going to be the fun stuff, I promise. So hold on to your hats there. Also, there's secondary colors, which are colors mixed from two primaries, which also may not be what you think they should be. And then we'll talk about the terms shades, tints, and tones, and neutrals, which refer to the addition of black, white, gray, or complements to a color. So when you add black, that's called a shade. Pretty easy to remember when you, you know, it's dark, right? So it's a shade. When you add white, it's a tint, which might get a little more confused because we talk about tinting things with a certain color, but just think of it as uh, tinting something white. So everything's white is tinted. And then if you add gray, which is basically the inclusion of both black and white, you get a tone. And tones sometimes are referred to as neutral because they look like they're unsaturated. They don't have a lot of the hue in them. But that's not exactly what makes it neutral. Neutrals actually are mixing complementary colors. So they could be very dark or they could be very light. And they can include black or white or gray. But without that complementary color, you haven't really neutralized the hue that is the undertone of the color. But anyway, those are kind of the terminologies for that section that we'll talk about. And I also want to talk about temperature, which is whether a color is warm or cool. And this is really like a perception thing that we have with color. And then we have this term color models. Now, this will actually just transition us right into the beginning of this conversation. Color models refer to the way color is mixed and communicated. And like I already said, because I jumped the gun, (laughs) because I was excited, the two major color models are the light color model and the pigment color model. But there are kind of two pigment color models. So we're going to have to talk about all these. So that's your terminology. Don't worry if you didn't catch all of that. The quick introduction will allow you to more readily grasp this terminology when you hear it a second or a third time. So I just wanted to introduce it to you if you had not heard these terms before. So you have a little bit of context as I go into this conversation. Mind you, this conversation might end up feeling like a bit of a roller coaster, but, uh, you know, buckle up and I think you'll be surprised by what you learn. It is super interesting, even if it's something that you don't think you'll end up using, although I almost guarantee you, you will use this information in some fashion. You'll probably come away with some fun trivia, not to mention, hopefully, a thrilling new position from which to work with color. Let's first talk about the primaries. Let's talk about the real primaries. Primaries are confusing because most people have been taught a somewhat incorrect version of primaries. Plus, we have two different sets of primaries, depending on whether you're looking at the light color model or the pigment color model. Probably the first question in your mind is, why are light color models and pigment color models different? I bet you always thought that the primaries that you know, red, yellow, and blue, would be true whether you were using light or using pigment or using anything that has to do with color. Those should just be the primaries. And if you mix those, you can get any other colors in the rainbow, right? Well, unfortunately, that is absolutely not correct. (laughs) For one, the way light works is very different than the way pigment works. 
mixed light is like what you see on your computer screen, your phone screen, that kind of thing. Or in a theater setting, when they do the dramatic lighting, they're mixing light. And then pigment is pretty much the color of any surface that you see. The color that you're seeing is a pigment color. And the reason these are so different is because when you're using light, you're adding colors from the light spectrum together. So you're pulling from the rainbow and putting them together out of light itself. In the world of light color models, the three primaries are actually red, green, and blue. So that's known as RGB. You may have heard of that in like photo editing software. It's the RGB is that color mode that the photo editing software is always yammering about. (laughs) The little things, boxes that come up and little sliders for R and G and B and they're mixing light. They are not mixing pigment. And this is actually what our eye does. And I think I'm going to be simplifying this a bit too much. So people who know the real details in this, don't give me a hard time. (laughs) But the eyes have three cones, three different types of cones in them that perceive color. There is a red cone, a green cone, and a blue cone, the RGB again. And the light that comes in the eyeballs, the cones perceive the long red wavelengths, the medium green wavelengths, and the blue short wavelengths, if I remember this correctly. And they mix them to perceive all the colors that are coming into our eyes. So it makes sense that the primaries of mixing light are the same as what the little mechanisms in our eyes are perceiving and sending to our brain because they're just light sensors, right? So if those mechanisms are using just red, green, and blue to send all the information about all the colors seen in the world to the brain, it makes sense that the light primaries in the light that we actually use out in the world would mix in the same way that our eyes are basically doing with those three wavelengths. Because this type of color mixing is additive or adding light together, it's known as an additive color model. RGB is an additive color model. I know you're probably wondering why you need to know this, but just hold on. It's going to help you remember and understand some pretty important stuff about artist colors and just colors out in the world. Yeah. What about these artist colors? What about pigments? So first of all, whenever I say pigment in this conversation, I'm going to be talking about the color of any surface. Like if you looked at paint out of a tube, it has a surface, right? And you're seeing a color from it. And if you look at a ball and it's blue, it's you're seeing blue on the surface of it. That's what you're thinking, at least. (laughs) But it's actually kind of not true either. (laughs) We'll get to that in just a second. But pigment is going to refer to color that is on an object. It's simply going to refer to any color out in the real world, out in a solid object or not so solid object or an object, tangible, something that's tangible that's not light, right? (laughs) Pigment color is not light, but it's actually still all about light. But with pigment, it's light hitting the objects, hitting the surfaces, and then only parts of the light spectrum bounces off the surfaces and into our eyes. So we only see the part of the light spectrum that's reflected off of those surfaces. And this happens because different surfaces absorb different parts of the light spectrum. And what isn't absorbed makes up the color we see, that limited bit of the light spectrum that bounces into our eyeballs. Because of this absorption, pigment colors, yeah, they're referred to as subtractive because color is taken away from the light spectrum available to us for our eyes to see and our brains to interpret. And this makes pigment color the opposite of light color. Light color model is additive and the pigment color model is subtractive. Now, if they're opposite and the primaries of light are RGB, then what is the opposite set of primaries for pigment? We were taught that pigment primaries were red, yellow, and blue. But if red, green, and blue are the light primaries, then two out of the three pigment primaries we were taught about can't be the opposite of light primaries because red and blue are already in the light primaries. So we need three colors that are the opposite and not included in the light primaries. Ooh, Does that kind of throw you? (laughs) We've all been taught red, yellow, and blue. And they're not actually the real primaries of a pigment color model. This is why color has been so hard for so many people for so long. I know for me, I just thought I was just stupid. 
about mixing color. I could not mix a clean green or a nice purple or a decent orange with the understanding of color that I had. I just thought, well, I'm I just suck at this. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Other people have got this down. There is something that I am completely missing. And for some reason, my brain can't figure it out. I just don't have the skills, whatever it is. So I know I beat myself up a lot in art school because I couldn't mix colors the way that we were originally told. And I also didn't have the best painting teacher, I don't think, because they never explained what I've since learned about the red, yellow, blue color primary model set that we were taught. There actually is a way to work with it. And we'll talk about that today as well. But let's first reveal the true opposites of light primaries and the actual primaries of pigment. Let's look at this by thinking about a standard color wheel with red, yellow, and blue being the primaries. What are the opposites? Like the opposite of red is green on that wheel, but it's not the opposite from the light primaries. The opposite of light models, red, is actually a color known as cyan or cyan. I've heard it said different ways, but cyan is the way I say it, the way everybody I know says it. <laughs> it's a bit of a bluer turquoise, not so green as turquoise, if you're unfamiliar with the color. And then the opposite of green in the RGB is magenta, that beautiful deep pink color. And the opposite of blue is not orange. <laughs> it's yellow. Yep, the true primaries of pigment color are cyan, magenta, and yellow, aka CMY. Some of you may have heard the terminology CMYK if you've dealt with printing on any level or you have a color printer and you have separate cartridges, you'll have a cyan, magenta, and yellow. And these are used in printing because they are the true pigment primaries and enable those printers to make up any color they need to to print off photographs or whatever it is that you are printing. So here's where kind of knowing the light color model helps with the pigment color model because you now have an understanding of these two sets of primaries, which are opposite each other in two different color models. And they will also reveal the secondaries for you and can help you shift from an RYB color model to a CMY color model if you choose to do so. But it does take some adjustment. And the first one is going to be about the color wheel. The opposite of red being cyan means that on a color wheel for pigment, their secondaries are actually the primaries from light. So RGB are your secondaries in a pigment color model. So red, green, and blue, not green, orange, and purple or violet, actually. In fact, uh, yeah, orange and violet don't even come up in a primary or secondary position on a pigment color model if you're talking about the true, actual, scientifically based color model for pigment. So once again, your primaries in a pigment-based color model are cyan, magenta, and yellow, and your secondaries are actually red, green, and blue, right? <laughs> your mind just kind of exploded. If you've never heard this before, I know the first time I heard it, I was like, what? kind of just, it still blows my mind. It was so ingrained for so long. And it's weird because I've worked in printing and publishing for so long, and yet that didn't really, for some reason, <laughs> cross the barrier into my artwork. But we're going to do that for you. So take a breath. And if this is brand new to you, maybe you want to stop for a moment, <laughs> get a cup of tea, get a little comforting bit of chocolate, go hug your cat and pet your dog. <laughs> And know that the world is still okay, but it is totally shifting for you, right? Okay, so if you've gone off and gotten your tea or whatnot, I actually did. <laughs> she paused and went and got some tea. Let's talk about why this happened. Why were we taught that red, yellow, and blue were primaries when scientifically it's not true? Well, it all started somewhere around the 17th century. There were a number of scholars who tried to propose that there were the three primary colors for painters that everybody should know. And they started developing this out of red, yellow, and blue based on what they had available in pigment. So if we want to blame anybody for this confusion, we can blame Mother Nature for not providing us with a source of cyan pigment or magenta pigment that artists were using or were able to use. So they had what was available. And in their eyes, from the pigments that they had available, red was a primary, yellow was a primary, and blue was a primary, and you could mix almost any other color from them. 
but only sort of. <laughs> Later on in the 20th century, chemistry would provide those pigments needed to properly create a cyan and a magenta and a true yellow actually as well. And these more precise primaries were then readily adopted by the printing industry. But for some reason, it was too late, at least for Western society's language and association with color, to have it translate into art materials. The problem was no one had made artist colors, especially in paint, pastels, etc., in these colors, in the CMY colors. So it wasn't being used. It wasn't being taught. It wasn't available. All those things made it so that even here, even now, even in schools today, RYB is being taught red, yellow, and blue as primaries. And uh, students everywhere are trying to mix greens from yellow and blue and just being confused. Unless they were taught about color temperatures. And we'll get to that in just a second. So I tried to find out when CMY started making its way into artist materials, paint in particular, because that always seems to lead the way with this kind of thing. So I don't know exactly when that happened, but it wasn't that long ago that it became a more regular thing that you would find these colors in artist materials. I know when I was in art school, these were not available in anything that I had. And of course, we weren't taught about CMY, but we are modern people. So if you're open to switching to cyan, magenta and yellow, you'll likely find your color mixing is going to be brighter and more saturated and cleaner, as I like to think of it, than through the use of RYB. Now, caveat, not all artist materials have a cyan, magenta, and pure yellow available. But if you do, I do want you to consider it. It is a complete mind shift. It will take a little while to get used to the idea. But the first thing you probably want to do if you're up for it is find yourself a CMY color wheel. And you may have heard the term CMYK, and I'm not saying the K because it's not part of the color model. K actually means black. It's the key color in printing. It's called key that black is used to actually make shades and define things in printing. But in any case, get a CMY color wheel. I do sell them and you can find them at 10thMuseArts.com. I don't have a ton left, but you can jump in there and maybe I'll get a discount for you in the newsletter. So if you got the newsletter, take a peek for that discount so you can grab that color wheel if you'd like. You can also try to print them directly off of uh, something that you find online. Unfortunately, most of your printers will not take the image that you have on your screen and translate it directly uh, and correctly to what you print out on your computer. And you may have known that like when you're doing photographs and stuff, it doesn't always translate because guess what? The images and the colors that are on your screen are light <laughs> and they mix differently and they show differently. And then of course, what you have coming out of your printer is pigment and it is a different color set and it works differently. In any case, you won't have a very exact model if you print it. And I mean visually, because they won't look quite right. The cyan and the magenta will not be as bright as they look on your screen. But you will have the correct type of color wheel with the correctly labeled colors and distribution of those colors around the wheel. Get what you can and start working with that if you are up for it. Because I'm not here today to convince you to use CMY. I do, however, think it would be a shame for you to not at least try to do some color mixing if you have to do color mixing for your work with CMY if it's available. And this includes even mosaics or collage or photography. Thinking about cyan, magenta and yellow as your primary colors and thinking about the color wheel with those on them because the contrasting colors, the complements are not going to be the same on a CMY color wheel as on an RGB color wheel. They're close. They're very close but they're not the same. And it's going to be really interesting if you start thinking in terms of complements and opposites and analogous colors using a CMY wheel. Okay, up to this point, you're kind of taking my word for it <laughs> as to why CMY works and why RYB does not. So I'm going to explain to you why RYB does not work as a color mixing model. And to do that, I need to talk about mud and not the kind that I have tons of outside because it's been raining. But a lot of times you mix colors and you're like, they just don't look very bright. They just look blah. And that's because basically you're making a version of mud. When you mix all your primaries together, your cyan, magenta and yellow, you end up with mud, a kind of brown or gray or brown gray color because all of the colors are together. Everything's contrasting, everything else, you get mud. When you use RYB, red is not a primary. Red is a combination, and this is going to blow your mind. Red is a combination of yellow and magenta. 
And if you don't believe me, look at the visuals. And there's an example done with polymer clay mixing magenta and yellow to get red and mixing cyan and magenta to get blue. Now, remember when we defined what primaries are, they're non-reducible colors. They can't be mixed from anything else. So how is it possible to mix a red if it was a primary color? Well, it's not. So that's part of your proof. I know that's going to just boggle your mind. It still boggles my mind, but it works. And the proof is in the doing of it. So go out there and buy yourself some cyan, magenta, and yellow in whatever medium you either work in or a medium that you feel comfortable working in and try it. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be like a magic show to you to see this happen. So here's the thing. Since magenta and yellow can make red, if you mix red with blue to try to get a nice bright purple, it's not going to happen because red has yellow in it and it has magenta in it. And now you're adding blue, which has cyan in it. So you have all three primaries when you're mixing that red and that blue together. All three of the primaries are in there. All three of the true primaries are included, red being yellow and magenta and blue being magenta and cyan. So they're all in there and that's why they're muddy because all three of your primaries are together and that's what you want to avoid if you want bright colors. So if you're trying to make green and you mix yellow and blue, same thing. Blue is cyan and magenta. So you've got yellow, cyan, and magenta all in the same mix. And so your green doesn't look very bright. That's why color mixing has been so frustrating for so many of us. Now, if this is a bit too mind blowing and you're not ready to move into a whole nother color system, because some of us aren't, it's fine. You can use the idea of color temperature to help you mix correctly. But understanding that the three true primaries are in your red and are in your blue that you are trying to mix with will help you in choosing the right temperature color to mix with. If you have red on your palette, I'm going to just use paint because it's the easiest one. All of us have probably dealt with paint at some point. If you have red on your palette, you can have a warm red or a cool red. Now, what the heck does that mean? Warm means that you lean into the warm side of the color wheel. And the warm side of the color wheel include all the things that feel like fire and feel warm. So everything from yellow, green through uh, yellow, orange, red, and magenta. Those are all considered warm colors because our visceral response to those colors is that they appear warm. They represent and are associated with things that feel warm fire and sunlight, the flush of our skin when it turns red, all that kind of stuff. And then cool colors we associate with things that are cool. So that goes green and cyan and blue and violet. Those colors are the colors of water and lush foliage and even like ice and nighttime when things are cooler, when the sun's not out. Most colors appear cooler, bluer, purpler, that kind of thing. Your cool colors and your warm colors. We have a visceral response to them. And it also defines where things are leaning on a color wheel. So if you choose a red, which is kind of smack in the middle of the warm section of a color wheel. So you're like, how could there be a cool red? Well, every red in the available pigments that you have in any artist material, you'll find reds and blues and greens and all these that lean one way or the other, that they lean on the color wheel towards the warmer colors or towards the cooler colors. So you can have reds that lean more towards yellow, maybe a little orangier. And then you have reds that lean towards magenta and maybe have a little bit of a violet tinge to it or magenta tinge to it, actually. When you are laying out colors for paint or for clay or for anything else, you can choose to work with RYB, but choose a warm and cool version of each of your primaries, including yellow, which even though it's a primary in both of these models, both the CMY and the RYB color models, it's very hard, especially in the pigment world, to slice out a very true version of those colors from the basically the light spectrum. So you have 
yellows that are warmer, which means they lean just a little bit towards orange, and you have yellows that are cooler that lean just a little bit towards greens or blues or cyans, right? See, I can't even say it when I talk about the way they lean. I don't even use magenta and cyan as often as I probably should, but it's just, this is how we were raised. So that's okay if it doesn't really sink in for you. But knowing that if you want to mix a purple, you can choose a red that leans towards violet, and you can choose a blue that leans towards violet you're going to have less of that third primary that you don't want. So in red, if you're trying to make a purple, you don't want yellow, okay, right? I mean, it's the opposite in the traditional color wheel. So if you added yellow to purple, you get mud too, right? So pick a red that's on the cool side. It leans away from the yellow. So you can just be mixing the red with more of the magenta and the cyan in it, more of the blue. And then you won't be mixing that third primary in it, at least not very much. And so excluding as much of that third primary as possible will give you a cleaner mix, will give you a cleaner color. Does this make sense? I feel like this is so much information that could be new to you and so mind boggling. And it's, I'm giving it to you in an auditory fashion, <laughs> which is why I'm going to do so many visual aids for you. If you want the technical term for what we were just talking about, it's known as color bias. So that's a characteristic seen in a hue that tells us what the other hue is that it leans towards. So a particular yellow, if it's not a true yellow, color bias characteristic identifies that it has a touch of cyan or it has a touch of magenta and leans one way or the other. So a touch of magenta would make it lean towards warm and a touch of cyan or green is what we probably would see would lean towards cool. So yeah, if you want to stick with RYB, uh, or if you don't want to stick with RYB and you want to do CMY, the same rule applies. You want not to have cyan, magenta, and yellow mixed together unless you want neutrals, you want mud, you want to go that direction. But basically knowing this means you're going to have control over how muddy or how bright and saturated your colors will be because now you understand why the colors do get muddy when they do and how to avoid that. Now that can transition us into the one last thing I just want to bring up, and this is going to be pretty short, the definition and role of shades, tints, tones, and neutrals. Because when you're mixing color, those also play into the end result. So you can't just mix your yellow and your cyan together to get just any green. Very often we are looking for a grass green or a lime green or a mint green. And in order to get those colors, you have to add white and or black and or a complement, maybe all of them. And that's when you tint, shade, tone, or neutralize your color. So a grass green or a leaf green is usually a little bit darker. So you're probably throwing in a little bit of black in there, just a touch to get it to lean into those darker shades. And if you're looking to make a mint color, that leans towards pastel. So you add a little white to take that down and tint it into your mint color. And if you add both white and black, because white and black together make gray, right? <laughs> so if you had gray, then you tone down your color and you get like a smoky green, or you can add the complement to that green, which is magenta. <laughs> I have to stop even thinking about it for a second. What's the opposite? But yeah, you add a little magenta and you get like a sage green, actually, depending on how much you put in there. And it neutralizes the color because you're actually starting to get it to lean towards mud, right? So, because if you put green and magenta together, green has yellow and cyan, and then magenta is magenta. Now you have all three primaries, so it will start going muddy, but that's not necessarily a bad thing if you want a nice neutral color. Yep, sage is a neutral color, unlike the person. But if you say it's a little muddy, then I can't say that's not unlike the person <laughs> referring to myself. And speaking of mud, you can mix the black and white or gray and a complement and really neutralize those colors because the complement neutralizes the hue and the tint and the shade, the black and the white, tone down the saturation of the color. Just think of black, white and the complement of whatever you're working with or really any other color that has the third primary in it. You put those together to make all kinds of colors. So those are really what your palette is. Your palettes are your primary. So you can, so in paint, for instance, you can work with just cyan, magenta, yellow, black, and white, right? Because you can make any color you need to out of the CMY. And then the black and white can 
shade, tint, or tone. And then you can go neutral by adding the gray and some other color that will make all three of the primaries included in your color to make neutrals. So if you take what you've learned and you either get a cyan, magenta, and yellow as primary colors in your artist material, along with black and white, you can make any color in the rainbow, right? Any color that you see out in the world can be emulated through the mixing of these five items. Now, if you want to stay with RYB, I would suggest that you get a palette. And if you want the most limited palette possible, two yellows, two reds, two blues, and then black and white. You know, so you're going to do a warm and a cool red, a red, warm and a cool yellow, warm and a cool blue, and a black and white. So what is that? That's eight colors. So you can work with five or eight colors in your artist material to get pretty much any color that you want. And now understanding why your colors were always getting kind of mucky and muddy and not what you wanted them to be, I bet you you can go out there and mix super successfully, just understanding that the true primaries are actually cyan, magenta, and yellow, and thinking about whether they're included in the mix that you're making. You can do all the mixing you want just having this information with the right materials, the right basic materials. Now, there is one other thing I should mention about colors. In your material, because we're dealing with pigment, there are different strengths of pigment. Now, we're talking about actual pigment, not the pigment model thing. Different colors have different strengths in your mix. So if you mix yellow and magenta because you're trying to get a red, there's a good chance you're going to have to put a lot more yellow in your mix than you will put magenta because in most materials, yellow is not a very strongly pigmented color. The pigments in other colors will overwhelm the kind of delicate level of pigment in a yellow. In my experience, most pigments, the darker the pigment it is, the more dominant it will be in a mix. So there's no exact mixture. Like you can't say do half yellow and half magenta because you'll get a red. You'll get a rosy red is what you'll get most likely. Mixing is not usually very exact in artist materials. So you'll have to experiment and practice to figure out how your particular artist materials work. But now you can go out and mix with a lot more certainty and a lot more control. So I hope this is giving you some hope (laughs) if you have struggled with this before. And I really, really, really hope you go out and find some cyan and magenta and true yellow and start mixing based on the CMY color wheel and see what you get. Cause it's just, it's like amazing. It's just really amazing what you can do that you didn't think you could do before. So that is the big color mix up that I wanted to start off this color journey with. The main thing was giving you the opportunity to consider cyan, magenta, and yellow as primaries. And if you have not adjusted to that color model, that maybe you could go out and try it. And if you have adjusted to it, but you never really understood why this worked better than red, yellow, and blue, now you understand. And I think it'll give you greater confidence as you move forward in your mixing, because you'll know why. You'll understand why. You don't want all three primaries in your color if you want it to be really bright and saturated. Hopefully. This is helpful for those of you who don't do color mixing because you do photography or mosaics or whatnot. Keep in mind that the eye mixes colors as well. So like think of pointillism or looking at an impressionist painting. Look at a a, a Monet. Oh my gosh. You go up to a Monet really close and you would not believe the colors that are actually in there making the color that you see when you step back. And understanding that color mixing that the brain does, which is very similar to the color mixing that we do on our paint palettes or with our clay or colored pencils or pastels or markers. If you apply any of these things in dots or marks that are set next to each other, even if they're different colors, I will mix as if you were mixing them together to make the color itself. And that's why if you're working in mosaics or weaving, embroidery or seed beads or anything, we have small bits of color. When you're far enough away from that item, those colors will be mixed in the brain as if those colors were mixed together like pigments. So if you work in any materials or forms for which when people step back, the colors could be mixed by the brain visually, then you would want to know this information as well. And then if you are working with photography at all, whether you're a photographer or you're just taking pictures of your art and you're trying to adjust things in your photo editing software, 
you'll now understand what, (laughs) number one, what those sliders are, the RGB stuff, and know that their primaries are red, green, and blue so that you understand the primaries that you used to know and even the primaries that you just learned about, the RYBA and the CMYs don't actually apply to doing adjustments on your screen. Now, I'm not going to get into the ways to adjust for light color because it's a whole other thing and I don't know how many of you actually work with it. But now that you know that is a thing that you can't think in terms of the traditional RYB primaries that you were taught in grade school. And you can't think in terms of pigment when you're making adjustments on a computer screen. You know that you can go out and learn about it because it's going to be a very different thing than what you have probably been thinking up to this time. So I'm going to leave that there. And hopefully your mind isn't mush. And hopefully you've gotten a hold of the visuals. So you can take a look and see what I'm talking about. And then just spend this month considering that, like every time you sit down to mix a color or you look at a color, you put two colors next to each other, you know, just think, are these primaries, secondaries? Where do these end up on the color wheel? Get that CMY wheel, either print it out or you can order one from my website or you can find them elsewhere. But if you do want to buy it on the website at 10thmusearts.com, that's 10th spelled out T-E-N-T-H-M-U-S-E-A-R-T-S.com. You can use code CMY15 to get 15% off your shopping cart. If you want to buy magazines or books or the CMY wheels or there's gray skills, I think I still have gray skills available there as well. Go into 10thmusearts.com and you can buy those for yourself with a 15% discount. CMY15 is the promo code you need. And that actually also helps fund the podcast because everything I make through the store actually just goes into this project. (laughs) So let that all sink in and go play with color. It'll be eye-opening if you haven't dealt with this whole concept of CMY. And then we will get back to some color at the beginning of the next couple months. In the meantime, please do let me know what you thought of this particular episode, because this is this is hard. This is hard to figure out what I could actually relate to you in a podcast. But if I do nothing else but get you thinking about color and thinking about how you use color, even if you don't want to change your color model, I think I've done my job and I think this will be an enlightening and new little excursion that you can go off on. So do write me and tell me what you think about this episode and what you want to hear more of about color or less of about color or anything that I maybe missed that you want to have me share with everybody. Or if you have stories about the first time you ran into CMY or what you're thinking now about the change in color models at thesagearts.com, go to the contact page to write me there or through social media on the Sage Arts podcast pages on Facebook or Instagram through messages or any of the posts on there. And you can donate on that homepage halfway down the buy me a coffee or PayPal buttons. You can do a monthly donation or one-time donation. That would be fantastic. Help support give back. Love it. And to make it easy for you, all these links are available in the description section or show notes section of the podcast player through which you are listening to this podcast. And if you haven't done already, please do hit the follow button on your podcast player because you may have noticed if you've been following me for a while that they haven't been every week because honestly, having a puppy is like having a baby plus other things that are going on with me that I'm not going to bore you with. And then this color stuff is a lot more intensive right now for me to put together for you. But hit that news and notices button on the homepage of sagearts.com and you will know when they'll come out or hit the follow button on your podcast player and you'll get notices for when the new episodes are out. Follow and get the newsletter. And what else didn't I say? I guess I didn't say just go out and feed that muse and go enjoy the colors of spring or the colors of fall if you're down south. As always, be true to your weirdness and then join me again next time on the Sage Arts Podcast. <laughs>